Hello and welcome to Untold Wealth. I'm one of your hosts, Vince. And it's me, Devin. And today, episode 15, we'll be discussing the news economy. We're breaking the news economy, Vince. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. Breaking down, breaking up the news economy. I'm here joined by my wonderful co-host, Devin. How are you doing today, first off? I'm good. I'm good. I don't think I've ever started off a podcast feeling bad. I'm always good. Yeah. And you? I, I'm excellent. Especially because today, like, I'm actually going to be diving into a part of the news economy that I think I'm really quite passionate about. Um... And yeah, I'm super excited to kind of bring to you kind of a fun little take, maybe a bit of a hyper focus on something. But before I begin, I wanted to just get your base opinion. Like before you started doing your research, what was, or maybe did you have any opinions about the news economy? Um, There were a few directions, I guess I wanted to take it this is kind of not really the question you're asking me, but it's the only way I can really answer it. It's like, there's a few different things, right? The immense digitization of it, right? There's also rapid spread of like misinformation and then like kind of how it's valued and how it's progressed over the years. But I don't, before this and even after it, I don't have very concrete views on like, you know, what I think about it. Uh, like whether I like it or not. I'm just not a news guy, basically, is what I'm saying. Right. Um, that makes sense. I've tried to get into it. Um, specifically, I I sign up to a newsletter or two to give me global news, but in a digestible manner that doesn't make me want to throw up from what, like reading big articles, you know? I see. I, don't, I just don't like reading the news, you know? It's, just, it's not my thing. Like, what do you use for news? I I actually would probably say I like passively digest news just either through like Google searching and actively digest news through like YouTube. Like if I see like a headline on YouTube about a current affairs, I'm sometimes inclined to click it. Um, and there's people like Philip DeFranco, there's live streamers like Hassan who like cover the news fairly frequently that I think I, I would tend to go to more than the typical kind of outlets like newspapers um, and things like that. So you fa- you visit those kind of outlets fairly regularly? Um, what would you say? Like just when it pops up, like if our Hassan stream pops up and you're like, oh, he's talking about the Israeli-Gaza conflict or whatever, you'll be like, all right, let's 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 go see our base chatters today. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, it's never like a active like, Very rarely am I like, okay, I'm actively trying to search something about the news. It's more so I'm presented with it on like my feed. And then I'm like, you know what? This does interest me. Let me click on the video. Mm. Um, But I think I'm much the same as you in the fact that the more like news isn't that big of a part of my life. And that's super interesting to me because like news has been ever present. I'm I'm just going to segue into what I brought to the table because this is a super interesting topic and i'd like to actually thank one of our most dedicated listeners and also my father <laughs> for suggesting it uh ages back let's go <laughs> <laughs> and yeah there's a lot of detail on this point because the news is as we've been discussing something that is ever present in our lives in terms of kind of trying to being shoved down our throats Uh, from physical papers, YouTube videos, and online news platforms like Reddit and things like that. Uh, Informing people about current affairs has never been more present in our lives, not just in our local area, but worldwide. And for better and for worse, uh, which is something that I think is summed up beautifully in this quote by Arthur C. Clarke, who some of you may know from 2001, A Space Odyssey, And he says, the more wonderful the means of communication, the more trivial, tawdry, or depressing its contents seem to be. Um, 
which I think is very, very relevant. Mm. But I'll be focusing on kind of a brief history on the news economy and then very much hyper focusing on a very specific aspect of the industry that I found interesting. Yeah. I, I'm trying because you led with that. You said you're going to speak about something you're very passionate about. And I'm trying to figure out what you're really passionate about in terms of like the news industry. Like, hmm, I know you're, you're a marketing guy. You do search engine optimization, you know, things for a living. But um, what are you passionate about? Like, I can't even I can't even think about it. It's going to it's going to be something. It's going to be something dungeons and dragons that's my guess it's my guess i'm probably wrong but that's my guess okay well now that i have you nice and hooked i'll 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 tease you a little bit more uh by talking about something different um (laughs) newspapers have been around for centuries dating back to ancient egypt rome and even china but the very first newspaper that had like an advert in it that actually brought money to the newspaper in a form other than you know paying for the actual newspaper itself um, was in a paper called the Boston Newsletter. Do you want to guess what the very first ad was in a newspaper? The very first ad. What what date? uh, What year was it? This was in the 17 or 1800s, I believe. 17 or 1800s. Oh, my. Um carriage i don't know like a horse or something <laughs> that was a terrible guess I <laughs> carriages huh uh, <laughs> shut up <laughs> don't say it like that <laughs> so it was actually a real estate auction uh because of course it was yeah. um and it reads as following at the crown coffee house in boston will be sold by inch of candle a very good dwelling in cornhill fronting the exchange as also a small dwelling house upon the same lot with it. Chat so, GBT could not have put it better. No, that's, yeah. Well, that's fine. I mean, who's not going to jump at that one? <laughs> yeah, it sounds like they're selling a nice dwelling close to the exchange with like a little granny cottage as well. That That's lovely. But yeah, as time went on, the idea of making an actual business model for newspapers uh, grew and grew more prominent because as we now know today advertisements are a big industry having thousands of eyes look at your product or service is something that people will pay a premium for and newspapers were this medium that they could provide ads with and in our digital age this has kind of taken to the extremes which i think is encapsulated by that arthur c clark quote And adverts are everywhere, from your phone to billboards, every part of our lives, we see some form of advertisement, whether we know it or not. And in such a saturated market, I kind of sat down and researched how these humble newspaper businesses are, A, making money in such a saturated industry, and B, what tricks are they using to convince a consumer to spend money on them when like news is such is so readily available for free wherever you look in our digital space mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah so specifically newspapers eh? yes so first and foremost to answer a how these newspaper businesses are still making money today because when I think of newspapers, it's difficult to get the like visual out of my mind of like a little boy or girl on the street corner shouting like, extra, extra, three shillings for a newspaper. Like, it seems such an archaic form of a business. I, I was just wondering how they have evolved over time. Classic and... Vince, proponent for child labor. Very <laughs> First thing that comes to your head. Okay, you know. I mean, a shilling is a shilling. What can I say? Um, yeah. So how, how do newspapers make money in the modern age? First and foremost, they're still running advertisements. That's for sure. But if we look at a single newspaper, the New York Times, which is arguably what, like the most popular newspaper in the world, we can start to see some trends 
um, that the industry has adopted as it's grown into this digital space. So tackling revenue. In, in 2003, the New York Times made just shy of $2 billion in revenue. Um, this was made up, a, up of around 25% print circulation and subscriptions, 65% advertising for both digital and print, and then 10% is just miscellaneous. In I'm 2000... Some of it must be their like, online subscription feature. Maybe well, this like was Wordle. In, this was in 2003. <laughs> oh, shit. Sorry. I missed that no problem. Bit. My bad. In 2022, they made $2.3 billion. So around the same. But interestingly enough, the print circulation and subscriptions accounted for 25% or around the same that it was in 2003. Advertisements dropped from 65% to 23% for both digital and print. And the 10%, which is made up of just random other bits of revenue, also remained around 10%. So my question to you is, and you've kind of took a stab at it already, over these 19 years, what do you think now makes up the remaining 42%, the majority of revenue for the New York Times? Yep. <laughs> the subscription model. Yeah, I mean... I mean, I was going to say advertisements, digital advertisements, but uh, I would say it's getting rid of the advertisements, which makes the money. Is that correct? That's Absolutely correct. Digital subscriptions in particular are now the largest portion of revenue for the arguably largest newspaper in the world. So I can only imagine the other newspapers are following a similar trend. Uh, and that, to me, is astounding. The The fact that they've taken but is essentially a physical subscription to their newspaper and just put it into a digital space and had so much success with it. Like I was looking for a secret, you know, something that they've done to revolutionize their industry, but they've just taken something and just made it digital, uh, which to me is kind of astounding and crazy. They just but... lock their best journalists behind a paywall, their best articles behind a paywall, and then they say, come join us. Exactly. Mm. And, you know, you could argue that maybe in addition to paywalls, the New York Times now has this global market, where there's before they just had, you know, New York and America. But I'd also argue that those people, that global audience now has infinitely more options to get their news from other than the New York Times. So they must be doing something there, something unique to entice a global audience to subscribe to them digitally and stay subscribed. Um, and this is the part that I'm passionate about because this, all of this is an excuse for me to talk about content marketing, uh, which I've experienced in. Um, so not Dungeons that. and Dragons. Not <laughs> Dungeons and Dragons, unfortunately. I knew it was about marketing. I knew it was about marketing. There's a little bit of there's a little bit of SEO in there as well, <laughs> for sure. But yeah, you you make content. And you, listen, you make content real good. Real good on this podcast. <laughs> hey. <laughs> I mean, and real good. Like, you, you've you had a few ventures in, like, content creation, you know? I mean, you, I don't know if this is something you want to show to the world, but I'm going to tell now. I mean, you've been on Fiverr before, you know, D&D stat blocks. You've, uh, you've even shown me some of the essays you've written. Um, you're really good at, at pushing encapsulating content you know stuff that really glues you to the screen you're you're making me blush i i i've mingled and dabbled in in a few different ways of creating content sure um and yeah i think that is a real big passion that i could apply to this research and i found two big ways that i think the new york times has been essentially trying to that has helped balloon this massive digital subscription service that they now offer. Um, this is not obviously all the reasons, but the ones that I have found more in, the most interesting or I think most relevant. And you can kind of break it down into two sections, which is decreasing barriers to entry and data-driven audience retention. Um, but yeah, tackling the first one, the biggest hurdle that the New York Times has, and I think that all online e-commerce businesses have, 
is to actually get a person to spend their hard-earned money on your service or product. Once a person actually pays, the chance that they'll keep paying in some form or another rather than cancelling, I think is infinitely more uh, easy to tackle. And to use an analogy here uh, for someone who is not as you know, attuned with marketing or doesn't quite get this, um, businesses are essentially casting a line out to try and fish for a bite. Um, and once they've actually caught a fish on their reel, they're very likely to catch it. And companies in this digital space are endlessly trying to find out what the right bait is to use, the strength of the line that they should keep, and the best type of rod to actually catch the fish in the first place. And while there are some evergreen ways to decrease barriers to entry, to get a consumer to actually, you know, buy in on your service or industry, things like high quality content, um, the one that caught my eye especially was when I looked at how much a digital subscription costs to the New York Times. Do you have any guesses? Hmm. Five dollars. That's my guess. Is that five? Five dollars a month. Okay. Yeah. So it actually costs, they have a weird model. They have three dollars per week and or ninety dollars per year. But no monthly subscription. That is weird, isn't it? But I think Uh, there's a lesson to be learned there because I said three dollars a week and ninety dollars per month uh, per year. But when you or when our dear listeners take a look now, I think they'll likely see what I saw, which is that those numbers have been crossed out. And instead, it shows that you can pay 25 cents per week, which is billed as $1 for the first six months, or the 90 is crossed out, and you can pay $10 for the very first year of your subscription. And I think that was what really hooked me into this because that is, I think the most crucial step when your customer is there at the page to where they are seeing the price of your service. That is when I think most customers are either going to leave or stay. And what they've done here is essentially take a loss in the first six to 12 months of a new subscriber and offered the most enticing price point to them that they can reasonably offer in the hope that A, you forget about having the subscription and you get charged after that six month or 12 month period, or that their content can persuade you to pay those elevated prices down the line. And the segues quite nicely into my next option is how do they persuade you to keep it? How do they persuade you to pay those $90 or that $3 per week, et cetera, et cetera. So, so are you talking about, so you talked about barriers to entry and you talked about the second, which was, um, retention, retention. So we're talking about retention now. Yes. Mm. So how do companies like the New York times retain their consumers? Because I mean, they could be using their money to pay for a whole host of other things, other news sites, other subscription services, what is the New York Times doing to maintain their consumer base? The first thing that I want to point out is that the New York Times has a ton of content on their website. Like they've divided basically like 12 to 15 different categories from like food to world news, the arts and real estate. And this is where data comes into play. Because what the New York Times does is that they analyze their readers data. They know which articles you read, for how long you read them, what catches your eye when presented to you, what you're most likely to click on. And instead of offering you just a, you know, a grab bag of different topics from these categories, they will offer you what you're most likely to click on. You so say they have the algorithm. They're basically they, the TikTok of news. <laughs> exactly. They have the data. And Factors like reading habits, demographics, and interests help the New York Times essentially tailor their content to you to keep you around. Do you think that is a breach of, like, some news integrity? 
right? Because you're making an echo chamber for people. It's an echo chamber they want to be in, and it's definitely benefiting them. But isn't kind of like a moral obligation of the news to be like, hey, take all the stuff, you know? Like, this is the news. It's important that you know all of it. What do you think? I mean... Not, not, I, not, not too crazy. I feel like the, the term news is so saturated at this point because news can really be about any industry or any category like if we're just looking at like world news and like you know the big picture stuff like i think that point is i think you're absolutely right but i i'm like struggling to comprehend like what responsibility newspapers have to show you like the world news or like yeah like, like it's a yeah. difficult question to answer. It's an impossible question to answer. I'm sorry to put it on you. <laughs> now, the no, more it's I'm a good, about it, the more it's I'm a like, good question. It's like it does seem like they're sacrificing a little bit of like, hey, here's important stuff. You know, I think more giving you what you want. I yeah, I, I mean, if it's from their point of view, I suppose it's like if the reader is interested in, you know, baking recipes that have low sodium instead of, like, you know, why, you know, <laughs> this whole Israel uh, debacle is happening with Palestine. Um, you know, pour more power to them. They, they they opted in to give their data, and that's what they enjoy. Um, I don't know. It's, it's a very difficult topic, and I'm curious, you know, if any listeners have a bit more of a, a strong opinion about it or... If we're missing anything, please do let us know, because that is a great question that I am woefully unprepared to answer at this point. But that is kind of the reality of the fact that these newspaper organizations are using your data to tailor content towards you. They don't just do it with their, you know, what you read, but they also do it with things like email marketing. Like you, you know, we've spoken about the abilities that email marketing has you can see how many people open your email who it gets you know bounced to how long it stays in the email box without being unopened those are great data points to show what people will click open and what they won't and in addition to that how regularly their consumers engage with it i saw this really interesting thing where as you engage less and less and less with the content from like a newspaper organization like the New York Times, they will have like these alarm bells ringing that you're more likely to cancel. And so they have these measures in place where they will send you more favorable subscription deals to kind of entice you to stay or send out kind of community engagement so that you feel more a part of this New York Times community. You know, they ask for your feedback. They ask for, you know, your participation in surveys. And there's kind of this extensive program that New York, that the New York Times and people like the Wall Street Journal continue to continue to offer you. So you stay in the subscription cycle. And yeah, that's kind of just the... I suppose, deep dive that I did on the news industry and how the news economy is persisting. And it seems to be working because, as we mentioned before, digital subscriptions are now the majority income, the revenue for news organizations. And so these barriers to entry and retention strategies are becoming more and more refined. To which, you know, there is a kind of ethical uh, question as well of like, you know, maybe there's a bit of shady stuff going down, not only with the data, but in the way that people are being marketed to, which is something that I see often. Like, as marketers, do we have a responsibility to market certain things more than others? Um, mm. And that kind of opens the same kind of worms that you kind of asked earlier. But, yeah, but that's very, that's, that's, uh, I mean, to the news industry's credit, that's not very news industry specific. That's kind of every industry in the world is like, yes. hey, we have all this data, we have all this incredible means to market to people. 
how far do we take it you know um exactly there's some bad and some good examples of it right but that's me what what did you think of this little breakdown what experience have you had i know you have done a little bit of email marketing but otherwise um, i don't i don't have many insights except this i mean the retention the retention kind of procedures they have i have experienced what jumped to my mind was i had an audible subscription for a good amount of time big fan of audiobooks and like fantasy books and audible kind of scratched my itch for a good amount of time but as soon as you want to leave it's like hey let's redirect you to three different ways that uh you can you know they'll give you a free month before you leave or, or something like that they'll try and keep you there as much as possible um, they'll offer you just like how you said that slash the deal you know the next six months is going to be like one dollar or whatever audible will do the same when you're about to leave um and if, you know it doesn't feel terrible as a consumer it just feels like whew, i don't know I, I don't really know what to think about it but yeah so so that's how the news is surviving yeah that's how it's evolved yeah i mean stuff. you look at this 90 dollars a year figure or that three dollars a week figure and you correlate it to like how much the New York Times is making. And you like come to the conclusion that like there's 8.6 million people that this marketing funnel has brought to its subscription base and that they've managed to re retain. Is that how many subscribers New York Times has? 8.6 mil? As of 2022, they have 8.6 million paying digital subscribers. That's excluding the... Um, the physical yeah i mean i'm sure they drop like uh, newspapers off at mailboxes and stuff but that's yeah. uh that's a lot of people it's um, a lot of people yeah but... they have just before we go into my segment they have about 620 million people visiting their website every month insane mm. and so they have more understand. to capture they have more people to capture <laughs> <laughs> i mean I, I wish I included, like, during the height of Wordle, during, like, the pandemic and stuff, how Ooh. much more subscribers that brought to the New York Times. Because that was Absolutely. a big, a very unique purchase by them. Is um, Wordle maybe, behind a paywall, or is it still free to play? I'm not too sure. I think it's free to play. I, I've never been... They said they were going to make it behind a paywall, but I um, would be surprised if they still did. Me too. But... I'm sure they throw kind of an advertisement or, you know, like a prompt before you actually can play to slowly begin people down that funnel. Yeah. Um, which is one last thing I'll mention. The idea of a marketing funnel when I was thinking about it is kind of a, a sinister thought because the, the aim of it is just to get people deeper and deeper in the funnel. And if you think of a, like what a funnel is, it's like this slippery slope mm. that people have more and more of a difficult time climbing out of the deeper they are into it um oh, which is dude. maybe a little bit more evil to, to this describe is, it that way this is reminding me of there is a an author a japanese manga author named jinji ito and yes my, girl, my girlfriend's a big fan of his and he has like these horror short stories which he's like apparently just the best at I've read a few of them and, you know, I agree. They're really interesting. They're terrifying. Terrifying. Just like, just the word creepy is just the perfect way to encapsulate what he does. Like it just sends shivers down your spine. But one of the short stories is kind of like there's this mountain in uh, in a Japanese like village or just outside a Japanese city. And uh, people start walking past and noticing human sized slits in the mountain. All right. But eerily enough, they, they start discovering more and more of them and they start discovering that there's a slit kind of for everyone in the city. And if you just put, you know, if you kind of like put your arms out and your, and your feet out, you can fit into the slit, but you can't like, once you like fit into it, you can't come back out again. Like it's designed that it just keeps pushing you slightly more into the mountain and then you kind of just disappear from sight. It's, it's so creepy, but that's kind of, Kind of the image I had in my mind yeah. when talking about a funnel. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> very, very creepy. Um, but yeah, that, that's just kind of what I brought to the table. A bit of a, uh, I guess, a little bit of a passion project of mine and something that I want to share. Very, you know, 
uh, thickened term, whatever. Anyway, Devin, what have you brought to the table? All right. So, so Vince, I asked you what, what you use for, uh, for your news endeavors. You said a combination of YouTube, perhaps, perhaps a Google search or two, and anything yes. that just pops up in conversation with, I don't know, possibly your friends or colleagues, things like that. Um, I think Reddit is a big one that I've used. Uh, that's, what I was, that's what I was going to say. I'm pretty much a Reddit individual. Um, I mean, it poses a few risks, right? It's a bit of an echo chamber. Anyone who's been on Reddit knows it's, and this is a problem with news as well, is that there is right-leaning, left-leaning news, things yes. like that. Reddit is, you know, one of that's quite notoriously left-leaning. I mean, I'll let you listeners decide uh, if that's good or bad. I'm not going <laughs> to go down that rabbit hole right now. But like definitely Reddit is it for me um, until I started getting like some newsletters and my emails and stuff. But I don't religiously keep up to date with them. I'll open my emails every now and then and be like, ah, let's let's read this one. But it's always very it's always very like American centric, which is another issue. But yeah, like I'm I'm a Reddit aficionado. So I kind of uh I kinda of wanted to figure out where where it all came from, right? So I did a little bit of research and I kinda of tried wanted to get a gauge of how big is the news industry, right? And listeners if you could help me out i'd appreciate it i could fucking come up with a number can you believe it or not <laughs> it's apparently very hard to freaking figure out all i could get was an estimate between 1.5 trillion to 2.5 trillion worldwide that is, that is because it conflates with the entertainment industry so that includes podcasts movies um the news television radio um and it conflates them all together so it's not quite it catches them all and it's not quite news so if someone could give me a number like that that'd be awesome but it's probably with it's probably kind of between those those different numbers right and then i kind of want to get a gauge for the biggest players in the market um so i've i've list right now of august 2023 uh the most visited news websites uh in the world so we you just chat about new york times Vince. Yeah. where do you think new york Times? rates i think mm, around third third or fourth maybe Oof, you are very smart they are fourth with uh, 620 million monthly viewers uh or monthly visitors who do you think is the top uh i mean you might have let it slip before we started recording so Did i'm I? going to say is it perhaps Google News or something like that? It's not. It's oh. not. Kate has it another guess. Is it? I have no idea. Genuinely, don't worry. It's the BBC. All right, the oh, BBC right. has one point one billion monthly <laughs> visitors. <laughs> I that is that is a lot of people. I don't understand why. Um, this is very mind-boggling boggling to me as a non-news aficionado. But there is one that jumps out to me. And I'm going to list the top 10 here, all right? There's Yahoo Finance, Yahoo News, Fox News, The Guardian, Google, Daily Mail, New York Times, MSN, CNN, and then BBC. And I'm going to be chatting about one of those today can you guess which one because i was quite surprised they were there yeah i mean it's also kind of weird for me that you have like fox msn and then also like like search browsers amidst that like those mm. two seem different mm. in my mind that's true that's true so yeah which which one am i gonna chat about we can actually give some spotlight to Yahoo for a change. I, dude, you you're just so smart. I'm gonna be chatting. <laughs> I'm gonna chat about Yahoo. Because, Amazing. Yeah, because because this is something like everyone's heard of Yahoo. Okay, for better or for worse, you've you, you've heard the word Yahoo, and in large part, you probably discounted it. You probably looked up a question online and then like Yahoo questions popped up and then you clicked on it and then it like pushed, put the question there and there's like no answer beneath it, right? <laughs> like it's, 
Yahoo is frustrating for me as a uh, Gen Z. I've never found any use of it. But at one point, Yahoo was the biggest tech company on the planet, pretty much making the internet. So how Yahoo kind of started was in 1994, all right? Two college students, all of these big tech companies <laughs> were started by college students, like one or two of them, Mark Zuckerberg with Facebook, Google's founders, and Yahoo. Um, but it started off as a search directory. Just because the internet was such a wild, westy place, these two dudes kind of just compiled a list of, uh, of websites that they thought were cool. And then they, they shared it to their buddies. Those buddies shared it to everyone else. And now, bam, everyone has a nice little list of website, right? And they added a keen little search feature and they categorized it. But that was it. That was like all Yahoo was. It was just a directory. It wasn't, it wasn't a search engine. It was nothing, right? But you were talking about advertising. And yes. this, this search directory got so big that they started putting advertising spaces on it, right? It was probably one of the first instances of digital advertising in the world. And, um, and Yahoo boomed. It, uh, I think it started in 1994 and uh, before the dot-com bubble, where it kind of just burst in about 2001. <laughs> it was valued at $128 billion us dollars i'm not too sure if that's in real terms or if it's in like normal terms back then but other way it's a good chunk of change very very big um yeah it was smooth sailing basically how it worked is they just they started kind of developing their own platforms so they were a directory first people were like okay put our stuff in the directory please they were like cool it only helps us eventually they got all the data they started figuring out oh everyone's going buying visiting these websites on our directory that are being used for shopping chatting um, private messaging emails um, anything in between they were like why don't we just do that so they pretty much branched their organization into a bunch of micro startups yahoo news finance like um, i mean there were a bunch of them apparently at one point there were 400 kind of like micro ips that they owned in yahoo hmm. um and obviously yahoo like news was one of them which we'll chat about later but it was fantastic for growth but it kind of bit them in the butt a bit later because since the dot-com bubble crashed and they failed to acquire google right apparently the google owners offered the or they offered the google no 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 the Google owners said, hey, we'll say you our, our service for $1 million, and they declined. They also declined Facebook for, I think, uh, $5 million or something. No, no, $1 wow. billion. It was $1 billion, $1 billion on the dot. Um, and Mark Zuckerberg was, was going to say yes, but then at the last minute, Yahoo kind of like did like an underarm, underarm tactic. and said, no, no, eight, $850 million. And then Mark Zuckerberg was like, no, no, no. But they basically, Yahoo, yeah. They dropped the bag twice. Mm. Yeah. It I could mean, be <laughs> Yahoo in our answers. To it's them. exactly. I mean, it's obviously a little bit of rose tinted glasses in hindsight. Like they probably would have just crushed the companies. Um, at, at least that's my opinion. You can't really expect Google and Facebook to grow to such massive corporations, especially under the stranglehold of a big corporation. But like they could have perceivably dropped a giant money bag by not acquiring these two companies. But yeah, so since. 2001 at the height of their revenue they were getting about eight to ten billion in revenue every year they uh, slowly started to drop slowly started to drop um they wanted until they got to about Jesus, as a car is just destroying my street outside i apologize this is the <laughs> they're filming that. the new fast and furious <laughs> clearly um what the hell is that i can still hear it um yeah, and Microsoft wanted to purchase them for forty-four billion dollars because they were on the down low. Um, Google was on the on the up and up. They had an actual search engine with an algorithm that could determine uh, what people wanted to see and could automatically direct people to pages. Whereas Yahoo had to physically employ people to input pages into their directory, so it was very, very, very inefficient. <laughs> from like a website storage standpoint, right? It was actually crazy. I can't believe they got away with it for so long. So Google kind of 
revolutionized the game. And that's kind of where Yahoo started to slip off the face of the planet. Microsoft was going to purchase them for $44 billion. They said no. And eventually in like 2013, Verizon purchased them for $5 billion. So this whole steady decline of Yahoo um, falling off the face of the planet um yeah it was no surprise to me because even when i was young yahoo was like not it but uh yeah yahoo is the most the most oh, listen this is a 2020 statistic they were the most visited news uh website in the united states which no i was kidding. in utter disbelief about like how is that possible they were second to google news which i don't know if that makes sense because i'm seeing cnn new york times um msn and like fox news here and those are all very united states um you know orientated websites and like services and news organizations so i don't know how accurate that 2020 st statistic is but the fact that they yahoo news and yahoo finance specifically hold the ninth and tenth spot on this list is mind-boggling to me that yahoo still exists <laughs> yeah if you add those numbers together um, would yeah. they be like so if you three? add those numbers together they sit at around 500 and uh, what was it 40 so if you put it 500 no 520 yeah then they would be fifth just under New York Times yeah so they're kind of the that's fifth, insane they are the fifth biggest news organization in the world by um, by monthly site views which is crazy like I knew Yahoo Finance was was widely used in the finance world. Um, but I didn't know Yahoo News was that big and that Yahoo Finance was that big to that extent. Like, blew my mind as well. But yeah, like, that's, that's pretty much all I wanted to talk about, honestly. Uh, <laughs> I mean, there's nothing breaking about the news economy. Um, it's, it's rife with the misinformation. Um, I mean, the digi digitization of it has been crazy, as you as you've said. I mean, I think... The global newspaper industry is only about like 30 billion um in comparison to to probably what you know digital news is but uh yeah there's, there's not much uh, breaking news in the news department they <laughs> got it sorted for the last 200 years on how to deliver news to people yeah i mean the breaking news that i got from yours is that you know i know a lot of people clown on yahoo but the breaking news is that they're actually a successful business that isn't just you know being held up by some you know some shadow investor yeah that that to me is astounding that so many like, people go to yahoo like if yahoo didn't have this like horrendous past like this giant like, drop off a cliff you would say they're a pretty damn successful news vendor like if they were just a news vendor you'd be like wow they are holding their own and they're doing a really good job especially on this financy front like they've kind of carved this niche financy role for themselves which i think is pretty cool but just that sharp decline and all the failed acquisitions they've had, failed IPs they've tried to launch, they owned Tumblr, they owned another social media site called Flickr, and they've kind of just buried everything they've touched along the way. So, like, maybe they finally settled into something that they can just do well. Um, I visited Yahoo before um, the podcast, and I was like, oh, this seems like a pretty decent news website. Um, <laughs> I couldn't tell if there was a subscription model. But listen, I would not be surprised oh, sure if the top 50 on this page, you know, have have a, a subscription model as the New York Times does. Um, but I'm I mean, I would hazard a guess that kind of BBC and New York Times would probably be the best, right? Like the I best think so. They definitely have the, the reputation. For exactly. It. Exactly. Can um, I ask you a, a question hmm. before you venture us out? If you had, you know, this is just you. As a person, if you created a email newsletter or just a newsletter that people could read, what would you kind of make or what would you include in the content for that newsletter? Okay, so you're saying I'm making a newsletter. What niche, mm -hmm. kind of like what little market segment would I uh, would I go for? Like what would the news be about? Hmm. Whether it's for, you know, promoting a business that you want to like do or just a fun little newsletter based on your interests i would i would do some some like esports newsletter for sure something gaming orientated it's probably where my passions lie like i wouldn't want to make a newsletter about like world news and things like that that's no 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 that's 
this is not something for me <laughs> what about you i think i uh, just the the 30 seconds that i've been thinking about it now i'd like like to have a subscription service like a patreon in the background and then have a newsletter that's just like D D content you know like just with little scummy clickbaity titles like mm. is your D encounter not good enough read these 10 tips or something like that um perhaps even an untold wealth newsletter in the in the future <laughs> <laughs> maybe 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 some it's actually so funny <laughs> we need to stop set we need to start stepping up our marketing game of this podcast Vince. we are two bright marketing you know business individuals who have degrees behind us <laughs> yeah we need to start I, getting our name out there for sure i <laughs> i think we do getting a patreon up there might help but yeah dear listeners we've broken the news economy as you can clearly tell <laughs> we, we <laughs> cracked it wide we've, open we've cracked it wide open we've discovered every single secret every single skeleton in the closet that we could think of <laughs> but um i mean obviously we didn't but we had a really good time chatting about it and uh, we hope you guys did too please if you don't mind, just a smidge of a five star, a smidge of a, a good rating and a like and a subscribe would go a mile. We're seeing a definite uptick in the trend of of view of views and and, and everything, and obviously impressions. And we're we're having such a fun time uh, making the podcast. Yeah, so thank you very much for listening. This has been uh, Devin and Vince Bullock, and this was episode fifteen of Untold Wealth. We will see you next one. See ya. Bye.